But even as the famous deck was being created, the idealism which marked the birth of the Golden Dawn was fading. By 1905, the founders had deep differences about the interpretation of mysticism. The twelfth card on the fool's journey, the hanged man, is about just this sort of disillusionment. It teaches the fool to question values and search for new solutions when things no longer make sense. When the hanged man appears in a reading, it suggests that sacrifices may be needed and that the querent must try looking at the world from a new angle. There was new thinking at the Order of the Golden Dawn, but it proved misguided. The intellectual curiosity of the early days turned into an obsession with the occult. The fool, too, is going through the darkest part of his journey to enlightenment. He meets the thirteenth card in the Major Arcana, death. This skeletal image strikes horror. But in the tarot journey, death doesn't mean the end, only change. The fool learns not to be frightened by change, but to embrace the challenge of a new order. Querents fear seeing the death card in their spread, but it seldom means physical death. It usually signals a new direction, a new job, or partnership. With death behind him, the fool encounters the fourteenth card, temperance representing the balance of heart and mind which he needs to thread his way through the temptations of the underworld. Reversed, the temperance card takes on a special meaning for business. It suggests conflicts of interest. Lily Gain was once consulted by a businessman who was being swindled by his partner. Yeah, I've actually had a guy who came in and I did readings for him and it's quite clear that his business partnership was really needed to be dissolved. It seemed like the guy was the, the accountant, uh, the king of, uh, king of pentacles reversed a lot. The guy was basically swallowing up the money. And um, really it just felt that independence, he kept coming through as the magician, he needed to be as independent as possible in his business. And I was trying to do cards on it and I kept thinking, he's got some funny ideas. I said, there is an orthodox way you can do this, you know, you don't have to sort of be dirty or do fiddles or anything. He said, you can just get rid of this guy. And then at that point, he took the tape off and said, that's why I'm here. I need to know how far can I get away with being really evil. Basically, he was planning to bump the guy off. And he wanted to know if he'd get away with murdering him. The darker side of human nature emerged in the history of the tarot with a member of the Golden Dawn, Alistair Crowley, creator of the Book of Toth tarot deck. The deck reflected his interests in dark forces and his preoccupation with the devil. The devil card is a new challenge in the fool's metaphorical journey. It represents enslavement to evil. The fool comes to realize that we all have a darker side which we must overcome. When the devil card appears in a reading, it indicates danger and threat. Years ago, I read for a playboy bunny who uh, happened to be a friend of actress Sharon Tate. And a month before the Tate murders, I read for her, and she got the devil and the tower and the nine of swords and the ten of swords. And I began to tune into them and I said, there's going to be a murder and it's going to involve more than one person. And there is something satanic about it. And there's drugs, and there's alcohol, there's guns and knives. And, it's, and I started feeling sick to my stomach. And I said, I can't talk about this anymore because it's making me ill. There is one further test for the fool if he is to reach fulfillment. The next card he meets is the Tower of Destruction. It represents the shattering of old illusions, a period of momentous change. The fool is forced to seek new philosophies upon which to rebuild. In readings, the tower can point to disaster, distress and financial ruin. Strengthened by his trials, the fool emerges from the dark part of his journey. At last, he sees a glimmer of hope 
with the next card in the major arcana, the star. In a reading, the appearance of the star card suggests altered prospects, new opportunities, a new start. For the tarot too, a fresh start is on the way. For the first time in its history, the tarot reached across the Atlantic. In the 60s, the life-enhancing aspects of Eastern mysticism rose to popularity on a wave of peace and love. The spirit of the age brought with it a renewed interest in lost and forgotten arts, including the tarot. Stuart Kaplan was on a trip to Europe when he first came across the tarot pack. I went there and found a tarot deck. I had no idea what it was. It seemed interesting. I brought it back. I went to a store in New York City. They bought 100 copies, and in the first year, I sold 200,000 copies of the 1JJ tarot deck. Since then, Kaplan has sold millions of cards. He has commissioned dozens of new decks, each one retaining the powerful symbolism of the traditional cards. One of the most familiar of all the ancient images in the tarot is the moon, the next card of the fool's journey. The moon is the card of intuition. Contemplating it, the fool discovers the sensitive side of his nature. In a reading, the moon card represents dreams and inspiration. Many tarot readers recommend quiet contemplation of the cards. I think the positive value of tarot cards lies in in how you can help yourself to understand yourself by looking at those pictures. I mean, the, the really um, striking cards, some of the major arcana, really can be looked into for a long, long time. I mean, you, can, you can use them to meditate. Meditators often choose positive cards, and one of the most uplifting is the sun. When the fool meets this, the brightest card in his journey, he gains optimism and joy. In a reading, the card is equally positive, suggesting contentment, a happy marriage, and a successful outcome for plans and business ventures. The positive emphasis which the 60s brought to mysticism has given a new slant to the tarot. Now tarot readers regard the cards as a healing resource, an aid in counseling and therapy. They see the readings as offering help. The reason people come back once they've had a reading from me is they've found that the readings are healing. They're not just telling them what's happening in their life, what's likely to happen in the future, but they're empowering them, they're healing them, they're helping them understand why it's happening, what things they need to let go of, what things they need to embrace to be able to go on with their lives. The fool is nearing the end of his journey through the major arcana. As he approaches his goal, he encounters the judgment card. It's a day of reckoning, but it offers a chance of redemption. In a reading, the judgment card indicates an opportunity for assessment or a time of testing. The tarot has had its share of testing, too. Parapsychologist Sue Blackmore, fascinated by the accuracy of her tarot readings, decided to see if there really was magic in the cards. I had ten people and an assistant. I asked the assistant to get each of the ten people to sit down with her and shuffle the cards and lay them out in exactly the way I would normally do. She would then just take the cards from them, write down the top ten cards and make a list of all those card orders and give it to me, coded so I didn't know which was which. I then sat down, imagined the person was in front of me, went through all the shuffling and laying out again, but laid out the ones she told me and did a reading on that basis and I wrote down all the ten readings and then gave all the ten readings written down back to the ten people and asked them if they could pick their own. Well, if tarot works in the way that it's usually claimed, that is it really does relate to the person who's shuffled the cards, then they ought to be able to have picked their own much more often than you'd expect by chance. And they couldn't. But Sue Blackmore's tests were not conducted in the same way as a normal tarot reading. The big difference is I was not sitting there looking at the person. And that, to my mind, is what you need. You need to be there with the person, getting the feedback, having all the psychological communication. What's really going on in a tarot reading is not 
directly to do with the, with the cards. The cards are more facilitators, if you like. What's really going on is between the people. It's psychology, it's not magic. Many people believe that a successful tarot reading is dependent simply on the reader's psychological skill. What it may be is simply as a psychological crutch for the reader. That is, the cards don't have the magic. It's, in a sense, the reader that has the magic. He's got all kinds of information in his brain. He sees people. He can size them up. He can tell what kind of person they are. He can tell if he's nervous, if he's this. He can tell if he might be successful, if he's a winner or a loser. But most tarot readers would disagree with this view. Their experience tells them that it's the cards that determine the reading. When I first started doing readings, it was the one thing that used to freak me out. I knew when I did my own cards, the cards were very relevant. And when I did people that I knew, but then when you do people you know, you think, well, is it just because I know them that I'm making that sense? I know the situation in their life. But when you've done hundreds of total strangers and you're just going by the cards and it's always particularly relevant to them, I don't know. There's a consensus that even given the accuracy of the cards, the sensitivity of the reader is crucial. 